Welcome back to 1% Weekly. In this week's episode, I'm going to talk about the aging population and why that's a mega trend that we can invest into profitably. I'm also going to talk about some big new regulations coming for business that even Brexit isn't going to allow us to escape from. And I'm going to introduce you to a 19th century economist you've never heard of, but you would wish that you had. For this week's Investor Insight, I want to look at one of the biggest trends we have in society at the moment, and that's our ageing population. The first baby boomers turned 70 back in 2016, and now in the UK, 2,000 people a day will reach that landmark every day for the next 19 years. And this is going to have both uh, enormous implications for society, but also enormous opportunities for investors. It always makes me laugh that people like Saga and McCarthy and Stone introduced the idea that you're somehow getting old when you turn 50 or 55, and you see these retirement developments for the over 50s and the over 55s. The reality is, and I, I spoke to a major provider of uh, retirement living property recently, the average age of their occupants was 82. So really, let's talk about the serious aging population and not what the, uh, the marketers would have us believe. And we now have opportunities for our high net worth investors to get involved in uh, loan notes that are funding the development of these retirement apartments with some quite attractive returns. So that's one way in which we are using the aging population to find new investment opportunities. One of our longest standing opportunities has been in the dementia care sector. I think we've now worked on about 15 projects. We've got hundreds and hundreds of investors go into these. And what I like about the partner we work with here is they've got a very specific strategy. They're only in the north of England where the uh, real estate is cheaper and there's a pool of available labour. They buy built and operational facilities so they're already there making money. There's no development risk. But they also look for some kind of angle. So one of the places they bought, the previous owners were so short of cash they couldn't fix a leaky roof. And when they went in there as the new owners and fixed that, they immediately made 24 rooms available uh, at £700 a week. And that just transformed the economics of the project. Uh, another example was where the entire first floor was not being used because the big company they bought it from had their own kind of weird management arrangements that didn't actually see this as being cost effective. They've opened up about 40 suites again generating £700 a week each, massively improving the profitability of that facility. So that's the second one that we look at. And the third one, of course, is uh, burial plots. We may be living longer, but we're not living forever. So there's a very desperate shortage, particularly in Greater London, of burial plots. Uh, and we've now formed a new uh, PLC company that's going to own 15 uh, cemeteries across the country. And there's a new online portal that's going to be effectively the kind of Amazon of funerals. So it's becoming a whole new asset class, a whole new investment opportunity based around this mega trend of the aging population. Okay, for this week's business bite, I want to tell you about something that's coming in next year that you may not have heard of, but which is pretty major. It's called GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation. Guess where it came from? That's right, the EU in Brussels. Just because we're leaving doesn't mean we get out from under this one scot-free, I'm afraid, because it's got to be implemented by May of 2018. We're actually already in the window where we're supposed to be getting ready for it. It really particularly is relevant if you hold data about your clients and potential clients, which I guess means almost every business in the country. Um, what it's going to mean for us, for example, is that you know how you opt into our various uh, videos or our articles or our reports. We're going to have to get you to re-opt in every six months. We're going to have to keep all the data about you. You're going to be able to request to see all the data we hold about you. 
Um, that means we can, you know, no longer make notes about, you know, this person's an awkward so and so. Um, so, you know, we've got to be able to make all that available to you. And also things like if you've made investments with us, you'll know that we ask for anti-money laundering stuff like passports and utility bills and so on. Well, at the moment, they get sent as a scanned email and we forward them on to the lawyers and they deal with all that stuff. But now you've got to start setting up audit trails. You know, what happens to those things? Do they get deleted? You know, could the machines be hacked and so on? And therefore, this could get into the wrong hands. So, you know, obviously, we already have the Information Commissioner's Office. We've all been registered for data protection since, gosh, the mid-1980s. Uh, but this is taking it to a whole new level. It's probably something you're going to need to run a project on. You're going to need to make somebody responsible for it. And you're going to need to write down your policies and procedures. Now that in itself is not a bad thing. I, I've been through this before with a, a, a medical business we ran where we had to do all of this for the Care Quality Commission. And it does actually force you to document your systems and procedures, which can make you a, a better business. So it's not all bad. But there is a bit of an arsehole to this, I have to say. So you're going to have to think carefully about how you get people into your database, uh, what information you keep about them, how regularly you refresh their opt-in so that you know that you're still sending them relevant information, and what you do with sensitive documents, both physical documents and obviously uh, uh, emailed and online documents. So, Think about it, look at the GDPR regulations. I may well run a webinar on this shortly for our family office members because I think it's going to be very significant. The fines are eye-watering. I think they can charge you 4 or 5% of your global revenue if you get this wrong. So don't ignore GDPR. Watch out for more from me on it and take a look at it yourself if you get a moment. For this week's tax tidbit, I'm going to tell you about somebody I've been studying recently, a 19th century economist you've probably never heard of called Henry George. But in his day, he was the man. He wrote a best-selling book called Progress and Poverty, which was trying to address the conundrum about how it is that, that when countries have loads of development, you also seem to get poverty with it as well. And what he discovered was that the link between infrastructure investment and land values was the most significant thing. Because what would happen is you've got kind of capital, you've got labor, you've got uh, land, and as you develop something like building canals or railways or something like that, you add enormous value to the land, the property on it, the rents on it, because you've now got a railway or canal or whatever. Um, and what he proposed, which was really radical, was that you should stop all taxes on individuals and companies because they are the wealth creators, and you should move that tax burden to the landowners who are the beneficiaries of a lot of that wealth. So take, for example, Crossrail in the UK. Um, this is a, a new railway link being built across the country, and what we're seeing already in anticipation of it is the value of houses, land, and rents going up near where the crossrail stations are going to be. And that's a classic example of what Henry George discovered. Now, a hundred years ago, people like Lloyd George and Winston Churchill were so excited by his thinking that they proposed a budget in 1909 that was going to introduce this land value tax and reduce some of the other taxes. Now, you can imagine going to the House of Lords full of landed gentry to talk about a land value tax was a bit like talking to turkeys about Christmas. They hated it and they vetoed it for the first time in 200 years. It caused a constitutional crisis that led to the 1911 Parliament Act, which forever reduced the ability of the House of Lords to veto bills. So really, I would love this guy to be around today. I'd love his thinking to have survived, but it's been overtaken by this view that we just tax people and companies to pay for everything, rather than taxing the value that's added to land by the infrastructure they build and the businesses they build. So have a look at Henry George and his ideas and just dream on about what could have been if that 1909 budget had come into being.
Thanks for watching 1% Weekly. I hope you got some value out of it this week, but don't forget, we want to hear from you about what you'd like to see included in future episodes. So if you've got any issues you're trying to address that we could help with, just pop them in the comment below and we'll get back to you in a future episode.